ok now we start with this first session on advancing migration governance global capacity development frameworks and processes through this session we will aim to look at existing and proposed capacity development frameworks that contribute to improve and strengthen the international governance of migration. With insights from distinguished speakers, we will examine the needs and try to identify the gaps in the field of capacity development. We will also examine how the multitude of stakeholders could work in harmony to assist strengthening the capacity of actors involved in global migration management. To help us today, I am honored to introduce to you first uh, Mrs. Liduvina Magarin, Vice Minister for Salvadorians abroad. Estoy, es un gran placer, un gran honor recibirla, recibirla aquí y uh, pedirle que nos ilumine el camino. Gracias por haber venido. Buenos días a todos y a todas. Un saludo especial al nuevo director Antonio Vitorino. Muchas gracias, gran tarea que me ha dado de iluminar este, este foro. Igual es un gusto compartir con el embajador Gómez Camacho, con Samri y con toda la mesa en general. Este día que es tan especial para este foro, vamos a, a tratar sobre las bases para el fortalecimiento de la gobernanza de la migración, marcos y procesos de fomento de la capacidad en escala mundial. Señor director general, distinguidas personalidades que integran este panel, amigos y amigas aquí presentes. En nombre del gobierno de El Salvador, agradezco la invitación para participar en esta reunión del diálogo internacional sobre la migración, en el cual abordaremos una cuestión clave para la exitosa implementación del Pacto Mundial para la Migración Segura, Ordenada y Regular. El fomento de la capacidad para encarar los retos actuales que plantea una gobernanza eficaz de las migraciones. Como sabemos, la migración nos ha acompañado a lo largo de la historia de la humanidad. Y es la primera vez que Naciones Unidas trabaja en un instrumento histórico y de mucha relevancia para la migración, como lo es el Pacto Mundial para la Migración Segura, Ordenada y Regular. Y haber logrado un texto fundamentado principalmente en el enfoque de protección de derechos humanos y que insta a toda la comunidad internacional a trabajar estrechamente en su implementación y cumplimientos no tiene precedentes. Aunque reconocemos el gran paso que eso supone, creemos importante continuar avanzando hacia marcos jurídicos vinculantes e integrales. Durante las últimas siete décadas ha habido un desarrollo progresivo del derecho internacional de los derechos humanos así como también institucionalidad global, regional y nacional que responde a su defensa y promoción. Así, la Declaración Universal de Derechos Humanos, la Convención Internacional sobre la Eliminación de Todas las Formas de Discriminación Racial, el Pacto de Derechos Civiles y Políticos, el Pacto de los Derechos Económicos, Sociales y Culturales, etcétera, lo cual fue la base para el proceso de la negociación del pacto. El derecho internacional reconoce que migrar o no también es un derecho humano. Aunque no existe un instrumento legal integral a nivel internacional 
que establezca un marco para la gobernanza de la migración, sí existe un conjunto de entendimientos, acuerdos, declaraciones y resoluciones que orientan el qué hacer de los estados sobre la migración, las cuales fueron creadas a través de relaciones, negociaciones y prácticas de Estado a Estado, plasmadas en tratados multilaterales y bilaterales, así como instrumentos no vinculantes que se han convertido en parte del derecho internacional consuetudinario. Por otro lado, durante las últimas siete décadas, la concepción y trabajo a favor del desarrollo ha avanzado de una concepción meramente económica hasta llegar a la actual que engloba las dimensiones económicas, social y medioambiental. El mejor ejemplo de esta sustancial transformación en la comprensión del desarrollo es la Agenda 2030, siendo la migración un asunto tan estrechamente vinculado al desarrollo, es más que pertinente la complementariedad que dibuja el pacto con la Agenda. La Organización de Naciones Unidas aglutina una vasta cantidad de espacios de diálogo político, agencias y programas cuya naturaleza o mandatos responden a la priorización que ambos temas, es decir, desarrollo y derechos humanos, tienen en la agenda global, con su consecuente trabajo a nivel regional y nacional. Dada la vinculación entre la triada, migración, desarrollo y derechos, el tema migratorio ha, sido, ha ido ganando importancia en el quehacer de estos espacios o instancias y también lle llevó a contar con un diálogo de alto nivel y un foro global a partir del 2006 y 2007 respectivamente. Sin embargo, la decisión de la Secretaría General de Naciones Unidas de establecer una red sobre migración responde a la necesidad de articular de mejor manera el sistema de Naciones Unidas, cuyo recalibramiento está en ciernes a partir de la resolución 72.279 aprobado por la Asamblea General en mayo del 2018. Tanto en la perspectiva global como regional y nacional, el papel más fuerte en el acompañamiento al desarrollo de capacidades en materia migratoria lo ha asumido principalmente la OIM, de larga data, pero cuyo trabajo ha estado regido por su mandato y membresía propia. La incorporación de esta organización al sistema de Naciones Unidas es un asunto reciente, así que la red que estará a cargo de OIM tiene el desafío de lograr ese trabajo concatenado que permita apoyar a los estados en los esfuerzos de implementación. En tal sentido, es preciso unificar criterios para la cooperación y tener un mecanismo de desarrollo de capacidades robusto, técnica y financieramente hablando. Hay que fortalecer también a la OIM. A más competencias también deben ir más recursos. La gobernanza de la migración también requiere institucionalidad en nuestros países, así como marcos legales nacionales de conformidad a los principios establecidos en el Pacto Mundial y mantener un mecanismo de seguimiento y evaluación. Por otra parte, es importante fortalecer las conferencias regionales sobre migración ya existentes, de modo que puedan convertirse en espacios de seguimiento al cumplimiento de la implementación del Pacto Mundial sobre Migración. Reconocemos que la migración es transversal, multicausal, compleja y que requiere una alta organización y coordinación, pero sobre todo de voluntad política de los gobiernos, coherentes con lo consensuado en el documento de Pacto Mundial sobre Migraciones, que conlleve a dar el salto histórico que les permita honrar los compromisos asignando recursos económicos humanos y materiales para una mayor y mejor atención a las poblaciones migrantes y sobre todo privilegiar mediante mecanismos acordados entre los gobiernos de los países de origen y destino la migración 
regular mediante planes de reunificación familiar, programas de trabajadores migrantes, becas para niñas, niños y adolescentes, entre otros. El Pacto Mundial viene a sentar las bases para que los gobiernos trabajemos en los niveles regionales y subregionales en instrumentos y mecanismos para una gobernanza de la migración que fomente las capacidades para atender a las personas migrantes con base a lo establecido en él, con enfoque de derechos humanos, lo cual requiere de compromisos en materia financiera y de cooperación para atacar las causas que la originan de acuerdo a la realidad de cada país y región. Es importante generar las sinergias, sinergias necesarias entre lo global, lo regional y lo nacional. Las adecuaciones que tendrá el Sistema de Desarrollo de las Naciones Unidas, así como también los mecanismos regionales y subregionales, deben considerar el tema migratorio y la implementación del Pacto Mundial como parte esencial de su trabajo. Con el anuncio de la integración plena de la OIM al sistema, se abre una oportunidad para promover un trabajo más integral e integrado en apoyo a los esfuerzos que como países debemos emprender. Señoras y señores, ningún Estado o gobierno puede gestionar con éxito la, migra la migración por sí solo. Es por ello que se necesitan marcos de cooperación a nivel regional e internacional desde el enfoque de responsabilidad compartida para gestionar de una mejor forma la migración. El manejo integral de esta es una de las pruebas más urgentes y profundas para la cooperación internacional en nuestros tiempos. Una buena gobernanza de la migración puede contribuir al desarrollo sostenible de los países de origen, de tránsito, <coughs> destino y retorno, brindando beneficios y oportunidades a las personas migrantes y sus familias, pero también fungiendo como un catalizador del desarrollo en general. Sobre lo anterior, creemos que debemos mejorar los mecanismos ya existentes a nivel regional para garantizar la coherencia de las acciones en el ámbito de la migración. Por ejemplo, fortalecer los mandatos existentes en mecanismos que generen acciones concretas para apoyar el desarrollo de capacidades. En esto, las conferencias regionales sobre migración y las comisiones económicas regionales podrían ser clave. Habida cuenta de que todos los estados tienen el derecho soberano de elaborar sus propias políticas para gestionar las migraciones y de que las oportunidades y los riesgos pueden variar en función de los países y de los corredores migratorios. Es necesario formular respuestas de políticas integrales y eficaces. Tales respuestas deberían basarse en información y datos fiables que aborden las dificultades particulares de los distintos países, regiones y actores. El pacto requiere un enfoque multidisciplinario, intersectorial e integral que debe insertarse en el marco de la cooperación internacional y las distintas iniciativas existentes en cada región. Es primordial que se incorpore tanto a instituciones gubernamentales como a organizaciones de sociedad civil, academia y otros actores claves de manera que exista una retroalimentación que permita diseñar e impulsar una agenda nacional común en materia migratoria. Como bien indicaba la guía de esta sesión, la migración, al ser un tema transversal y complejo, requiere la colaboración en varias áreas de política para desarrollar las capacidades de diferentes grupos de actores para garantizar la coherencia de las acciones. El pacto en sí es muy claro al priorizar el enfoque integral de gobierno para garantizar la coherencia horizontal y vertical de las políticas en todos los sectores y niveles de gobierno, así como el enfoque integral de la sociedad para abordar la migración en todas sus dimensiones mediante la inclusión de migrantes, diásporas, comunidades locales, sociedad civil, academia, sector privado, parlamentario, sindicatos, instituciones nacionales de derecho humanitario, los medios de comunicación y otras partes interesadas en la gobernanza de la migración. 
En el fomento de capacidades, todos los interlocutores a nivel nacional deben gestionar y facilitar buenas prácticas como la recopilación y el análisis de datos, el desarrollo de prácticas consulares eficaces, la optimización de los sistemas de gestión de fronteras, el cumplimiento de las obligaciones internacionales, la participación en la coordinación y diálogo transfronterizo y la colaboración en enfoques integrales de gobierno y de toda la sociedad para la formulación de políticas. Es importante asegurar los recursos técnicos y financieros, lo suficiente para responder de manera efectiva a la implementación del pacto. Los estados podemos tener toda la voluntad política y hacer nuestro mayor esfuerzo financiero, pero no, si no hay un acompañamiento oportuno para desarrollar o consolidar nuestras capacidades, probablemente no logremos los resultados más idóneos. Para ejemplificar lo anterior, me voy a permitir referirme a mi país. En el caso de El Salvador, la implementación de la Agenda 2030 nos han supuesto una carga financiera importante, pero el acompañamiento del sistema de Naciones Unidas ha sido clave. Asimismo, en materia migratoria, hemos realidad, realizado importantes avances en, en cuanto a las normativas y medidas de política pública pero no hubiésemos podido avanzar del modo que lo hemos hecho sin el acompañamiento de la OIM, cooperantes, organizaciones de sociedad civil e incluso nuestra diáspora organizada. Con base en nuestra propia experiencia y a vida cuenta de realidades particulares de cada estado, creemos importante hacer un análisis de situación para cada país y región con la participación de múltiples partes interesadas a fin de priorizar aquellas áreas que requieren fortalecerse o identificar aquellos esfuerzos aún no comprendidos. A partir de este ejercicio no solo se asegura el abordaje integral, sino también contar con requerimientos más claros para que el sistema de apoyo global o regional esté alineado a las priorizaciones nacionales. El Salvador está muy comprometido con realizar un ejercicio ejemplar, avanzando desde ya hacia la definición de un plan nacional de implementación del Pacto Mundial sobre Migraciones. A tal efecto, dada la complementariedad existente entre el Pacto Global y la Agenda 2030, tras una valoración técnica y política, se ha estimado pertinente alinear ambos procesos. Nuestro país espera contar con toda la colaboración del Sistema de Naciones Unidas, incluida la OIM, para este esfuerzo, tal cual ha venido ocurriendo en el caso de la Agenda 2030, cuyo proceso es ejemplar en, en parte por el compromiso de nuestro gobierno, pero a la vez gracias a todo el apoyo recibido desde el Sistema de Naciones Unidas. Muchas gracias. Thank you so much, uh, Madam Minister. Now I turn to Mr. Martin Shungong, Secretary General of the Interparliamentary Union. I believe, sir, you are the first African to hold this post, but you have been linked with uh, UEP for a very long time. So you are very much welcome, and please, you have the floor. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Director General, uh, thank you for uh, inviting me to this uh, very important gathering today. And uh, uh, we are really appreciative, as you have said, of the support that uh, we have enjoyed from the International Organization on Migration. Let me use the opportunity also to congratulate you, you. on your election and assumption of office as uh, Director General. You. And you can count on uh, the support of the Interparliamentary Union and the global parliamentary community in the accomplishment of your lofty mission, which I think is very crucial, especially given the challenges that we are facing today in terms of uh, migration. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm glad to be here to contribute to this uh, very important dialogue that uh, we are initiating here today. And I uh, think that uh, the issue that uh, is before us is a very sensitive one, and you all agree with me that it is very sensitive, sensitive and, and topical. 
I am therefore heartened to see that uh, uh, participation is very high in uh, this uh, dialogue. I am hoping that out of this dialogue will uh, emerge uh, innovative ways of uh, managing in a more efficient and effective manner the very crucial issue of uh, migration. I am here to uh, try to articulate the views of the parliamentary community uh, in respect of uh, this uh, agenda. And as far as uh, parliaments and uh, their members are concerned, uh, we can say that the question of migration governance and related capacities uh, comes down first and foremost to politics. That is what uh, parliamentarians are all about, uh, politics. With or without the capacity to grapple with the issue, members of parliament are driven foremost by political considerations that reflect the mood of their electorates and socioeconomic conditions at the national level. Much of what we have done as an organization of uh, parliaments with many meetings and declarations is aimed at establishing a common understanding among our members, among members of parliament, of migration as an issue that needs to be dealt with objectively and as much as possible by depoliticizing it. This is easier said than done, you, you will agree with me, but it's a necessary first step. We should realize that it is important to depoliticize the issue. As long as politics come into play, capacities matter little, and sound migration policies that can help reap benefits of migration and avoid the usual uh, pitfalls are uh, ignored. The uh, promotion of uh, parliamentary involvement in migration management has been a priority for the organization. And just to mention what we have done in recent years, uh, in 2015, we adopted a, a landmark declaration on the imperative for fairer, smarter, and more humane migration. It is a declaration that focuses on concrete measures parliamentarians can take to ensure sound policy making. So that's part of the capacity building exercise that uh, we have engaged in. Secondly, we have also adopted a handbook that is uh, being uh, disseminated widely on migration, human rights, and governance. This is a handbook that has been published in cooperation with the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights and the International Labour Organization. It provides information on the legal framework that exists and tools that parliamentarians can use to be more aware and conversant with the issue of migration in order to help ensure the protection of the rights of migrants and the governance of international migration in compliance with the law. The critical uh, contribution that parliaments can make to migration governance in the context of the global compact, once it is adopted, includes one, protection through the incorporation of migrants' rights in legislation, support for the development of a governmental approach, including adoption of indicators for implementation of target 10.7 of the SDGs and monitoring progress, promotion of a more balanced approach based on the empirical data about migration. And all of this is intended to help change the discourse on migration. In our view, in the IPU's view, parliamentary ownership of the migration issue is a prerequisite for developing a vision that would support a coherent parliamentary strategy adapted to the current situation, including reference to migration in parliamentary priority actions. In a few days' time in this very city, the IPU will be convening its 139th plenary assembly. And members, I'm sure, will be pleased to adopt a new resolution on strengthening interparliamentary cooperation on migration and migration governance in view of the adoption of the Global Compact for Safe, Orderly, and reg Regular Migration. That compact invites, or the resolution invites members 
parliaments to de design and implement a parliamentary action plan on migration for the implementation of the global compact when it is adopted and to set a timetable to report back to the IPU on progress made. Mr. Director General and Moderator of this session, ladies and gentlemen, you will have subsumed from what I have said that the Global Compact enjoys the full support of the uh, parliamentary community. And I want to use this opportunity to pay tribute to Ambassador Camacho and uh, Ambassador Lobe for having steered the global process towards the adoption of this compact. We hope that uh, in Marrakesh, the uh, global ownership of this uh, new international instrument will be uh, confirmed through the adoption of the compact. We believe, in fact, that the comp global compact strikes a fine balance between the rights of states and those of migrants. For this reason, it is a politically sound document that is sellable to politicians of all political persuasions. This, however, is not automatic and, require, and will require a proactive effort which the IPO is very pleased to be able to contribute to. The first political choice that needs to be made is to stop looking at migration primarily, primarily for, through a security lens. Parliaments need to understand that this is a development human rights issue that requires a whole of government and a whole of parliament approach. This requires a raft of institutional capacities to be developed or fine-tuned. Many parliaments or many countries in the world today lack a proper migration policy or have policies in place that are out of sync with social, economic, and environmental realities. Parliaments need to demand that strong policies be put in place and that citizens and migrants themselves be involved actively in the design of those policies. Parliaments also need stronger capacities to oversee the implementation of those policies, but then many of those parliaments currently lack those capacities. And that is where the IPU once again and the international community should help develop capacities for parliaments to migrate, manage migration. Enhanced migration governance requires the adoption of national policies that take into account the international dimension and which facilitate the incorporation of international dialogue into the planning of development strategies. In this regard, it is necessary to design this new migration policy architecture <coughs> within the framework of the holistic uh, structure suggested by the Global Compact. We believe that the time for silence <coughs> and isolated national migration policies is over. A holistic approach requires more coordinated and harmonized strategies for targeted interventions. International cooperation is essential to this end. We encourage parliaments to establish interparliamentary cooperation to facilitate consultations on and harmonization of strategies, the exchange of good practices, and to support the implementation of multilateral provisions, and to develop partnerships with other stakeholders. And I'm glad that this session is uh, dedicated also to looking at how those partnerships can be uh, forged for greater effectiveness and efficiency. We therefore stress the importance of partnerships, including with civil society, very important, and other international organizations. We're pleased to be able to join those efforts at the regional and international levels for, for broadened interventions with lasting impact. In addition, we believe it is important to continue reflecting on the following areas while developing targeted migration strategies the root causes of migration, material and financial support for development, increased investment, functioning democratic states, and regional economic integration are essential to this end. Implementation of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development is a viable long-term strategic approach 
in this respect. Sociopolitical and economic stability should be supported by a more positive discourse on migration. The IPU supports and encourages assertive leadership with a focus on positive aspects of migration and fact-based discourse by parliamentarians and governments. This includes officials, business leaders, the media, and other stakeholders. A parliamentary approach to this objective should include concerted national action plans and strengthened domestic legislation against racism and xenophobia and in favor of non-discrimination and equality. Two, our effort should also aim to promote improved access to education, training, and continuous development to tackle the increasing global shortages of people with tertiary level qualifications and the necessary vocational and technical skills. Three, the protection and security of women, children, unaccompanied children, and other vulnerable groups should be at the heart of the actions we take. After all, parliaments are all about representing all of society and not just part of society. As we know, the vulnerability of these groups exposes them to violence, exploitation, and other reprehensible practices, including trafficking, forced labor, and modern slavery. To conclude, Mr. Chair, I just want to restate that parliamentarians are encouraged to create a legislative environment that is, in, is conducive to human rights and hostile to indefensible practices related to migration in countries of origin, transit, and destination. I look forward to further interaction with the participants during this session. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Mr. Secretary General. The third uh, panelist is probably uh, one of the persons that is responsible for us being here today discussing. <laughs> I said it in the opening session, and I pay tribute to your lover and to uh, Ambassador Gomez Camacho for having been the co-facilitators. I think that once you are a facilitator, your uh, task never ends. <laughs> <laughs> So here you are again. We are hoping that you facilitate us to have a better approach to the subject that brings us all together. Uh, Jose, bienvenido. Eh, tienes la palabra. Muchísimas, muchísimas gracias. Y creo que I think you are right on, on once you are co-facilitator, you don't stop being a co-facilitator. Uh, this is not a joke. At some point, my daughter stop, start calling me co-facilitator <laughs> instead, instead of dad. <laughs> so you are totally right with what you are saying. Uh, well, first, quickly, uh, I'd like to, to congratulate you, Mr. Director General Antonio, for, for taking office. You have an enormous challenge, particularly um, from now, because of what is going on around the world. We really wish you all the very best. I, I not only know you will be very successful, but still, I really wish you all the very best. Thank you. Uh, let me, uh, I, I'll make uh, two or three points. And I'll start, uh, I'll take from where Martin left, because he made um, uh, an important point. Every, we have a tool already, we have a set of tools, which, which is what the Global Compact is. It's a set of tools, processes, procedures, framework that may be critical in addressing global migration to make it safe, orderly, and regular. Now, I say may, not because the instrument itself is not good enough, is not perfect enough, is not well thought over enough. In fact, it is all those things. The challenge that we have is precisely the politics. We have the tools on the table. The question is, how are we going to ensure 
that these tools are being used or will be used. That's the that's first challenge we have. And the answer to that is the politics, precisely. Now, I would approach it slightly different than, than Mr. Chungon. I don't think the challenge is how to depoliticize migration. Migration is and will always be intrinsically political. The challenge is how are we going to handle those politics? How we can make the politics right? And the challenge is gigantic because we are probably still, we've been over the last few months, if not few years, but let's say a few months, where migration rhetoric I should say probably negative rhetoric, is at its peak. Where political careers all over the world or in many countries around the world are being done or undone based on migration. Where national political, political leadership is being driven rightly or wrongly by a migration agenda, where communities around the world are, let's say, becoming hypersensitive, hyper emotional, hyper reactive to foreigners coming and joining in their communities. So how 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 can we do that? To talk about capacity building, putting the tools right, could be meaningless or empty if we don't put the politics or make the politics right. Something that I, and, and, I, and, I, and on this, I, I, I'm sure I speak on, on behalf of Ambassador Lauber and myself, because we experienced the process together. We both, one of the most interesting, fascinating, and satisfactory things that happened in the process is that in fact, despite of this global context, this negative narrative, these challenges I just, I just described it, we managed nevertheless to build not only a global compact, but this global compact which is robust, which is strong, which is sample, which is comprehensive, which truly addresses the challenge, which means that um, the politics can be handled or that the politics can be made right. And that's, I think, what we all together did in the process. So what is missing? What is, what is, what is next? I think the question remains the same as it was when we were negotiating the Global Compact. One single word, trust. Trust and more trust. So the same way we managed to build trust within the UN, amongst negotiators, from whatever side of the aisle each of you were on the discussion or on the conversation, we need to be able to expand these trust levels in a more broader global way outside the United Nations. Because the debate and the conversation and the narrative we are having inside the UN still does not match that one that is happening outside. In fact, it's the other way around. That one happening globally is not matching yet neither the quality nor the tone, nor the approach, nor the wisdom, nor the knowledge that we developed inside the UN. So there, Mr. Director General, I, sti I think we have an enormous challenge to go there. And I think, I, I don't have the answers, of course, but I think one critical element uh, on that, and again, using the lessons learned, if you like, throughout our process is the narrative. I think IOM, I think the UN as a whole, I think our governments need to start converging 
around a narrative. I wouldn't say a positive narrative. Of course, I wouldn't say either a negative narrative, just a commonsensical, fair narrative about the global migration challenge. Because if you see today, this, um, the global discourse on, on, on migration, well, it's polarized. Either you are pro or you are against. Either you are on one side or you are on the other. But a commonsensical description of the phenomenon is lacking. And this commonsensical description of the phenomenon, again, is what made this negotiation successful. So my first point, and I leave it there, is this one. We really need to find a way to build a better global narrative, to educate better, to make everybody slowly understand and to change slowly, it'll take time, this social collective perspective about migration. Again, not to make it positive, not to make it negative, just to make it real, to make it objective if objectivity can exist in something like this. That's one point. Second point, trying to start getting into capacity uh, building and so on and so forth, is the following. One, one, one very important element of the global compact, and this, by the way, will be fundamental in building a new narrative, is that we were true to our mantra of 360 degrees approach which means that the Global Compact was not an instrument to promote migration, not to, neither to or not to dissuade migration, but to manage the phenomenon in, again, a commonsensical, fair, rational way. So in this 360 degrees, which means that we approach the phenomenon from A to Z, from the causes, the drivers, through the process until it ends and how it ends, etc., cetera, et cetera, we very much focus on something that traditionally has been weak, if you like, in reflection and approach when discussing migration, which is the causes of migration the reasons of migration, the drivers of migration, and the role of countries of origin in addressing migration. Because normally, if you, if you go back in time how the debate had been taking place, the focus normally was far more on the role of countries of destination, less on countries of origin. Here we are focusing on all of them <coughs> according to what is necessary. And this question of the drivers and the reasons and the causes is very important because the whole idea at the end of the day is that someone should not be forced, never be forced to emigrate if he or she does not wish to emigrate. The idea of being pushed out is a terrible one. So we need to understand the global compact not as a, as a standalone instrument. I think we need to understand the global compact as working in concert with other global governance instruments that we have built in the UN. Namely, clearly, climate change, 2030 agenda, and absolutely financing for development. And understanding this as, as a bigger puzzle, global compact, climate change, 2030 agenda, financing for development, and maybe others, will also require a huge sense of cooperation 
Because at the end of the day, that's what the Global Compact does, by the way, which is creating a real platform for cooperation. So if we understand them as working together, as working in concert, we will have a far more coherent approach inside the UN at least in addressing this phenomenon. And final point I would make is that the UN system itself has a gigantic challenge. The UN system has the capacity has the tools, the Global Compact provides all the additional spaces and tools that the system could have been in need of. I think now everything is on the table. The challenge for the system is to organize itself, to be coherent, to work in true cooperation under the leadership of, of IOM, so it is able to truly provide assistance to countries on the ground. If, if there is somewhere where the UN system can make a gigantic difference, is precisely in working on the ground, both with countries of destination, which normally would need it less, but still is very important, but mainly and fundamentally with countries of origin. That in principle would need it more. I said in principle for both cases because now we know that migration is in fact much more south-south and intra-regional than south-north as we normally thought it was. So the role of the UN system is absolutely critical. And we need to help the system uh, to enable it to support countries in doing this. And within the, the same issue, we provided in the Global Compact, really, really on capacity building, one, one tool that when Ambassador Lauber, our teams, and myself were imagining, imagining how it would work or how to put it together, we wanted to bring something fresh, agile, expeditious, easy, well-focused, and something that would avoid at all costs getting entangled with big processes and bureaucracy and institutional complications, but it had to be something agile. And this is what we put there. Now the point is to use it. But the idea uh, in there is that if you are a country, whatever country you are in the world, since the Global Compact addresses the whole chain of the migration phenomenon, if you need capacity, expertise, support, advice on specific links of the chain, you would have a window in the UN system, extremely expeditious, that will or would connect you with whoever can help you to develop whatever you need to develop on that specific link, together with the necessary very specific funding for that specific purpose, so you can put it in place in really, or in a real short time. So again, we have the Global Compact, the tools are there, we think are very robust, we think are very efficient, we think will change the phenomenon as we want, but we need to make it work in a bigger concert, in a bigger puzzle, with other instruments, with, with a bigger sense of global governance, and indeed, as I said, trying to play the politics right. Never forget the politics. They are there. They will not change. They will remain. is 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 normal. The question is, how can we navigate the politics in a more successful <coughs> way? Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Director General. Thank you so much, uh, Juan Jose. Uh, and now for the last speaker, I welcome uh, Ambet Youssef, General Secretary of the Building and Wood Workers International, 
We are very pleased to have you here. We value very much our partnership with the trade unions, and uh, we give you the floor. Please, sir. Welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, let me again congratulate you for your uh, for being elected as a director general. I just wanted to convey to you that the global trade union movement welcomes your election. Excellency, excellencies, delegates, trade union, and civil society colleagues, uh, I'm very much welcome the opportunity for a trade union to be part of this global dialogue, particularly on the global dimensions of partnership and capacity building. The Building and Woodworkers International is a global union federation representing 12 million members in over 132 countries in the building, cement, building materials, wood, forestry, and allied sectors. A significant portion of our members and workers in our sectors are migrant workers, promoting the fundamental human and labor rights for these workers lies at the heart of what we do. We are pleased that the human and labor rights framework is firmly placed in the global compact. But ensuring compliance requires vigilance, clear monitoring mechanisms, and sustained action at the national, regional, and international level, as well as at the private and public sectors. And yes, there are innumerable capacity development needs that must be backed up with adequate resources. <coughs> Let me frame my remarks on capacity development by referring to the significant deficit in the current human, human rights regime, which needs to be addressed at the outset. Contrary to some popularly held notion, there does not exist a set of human rights that exclude people without papers from their application, whether they are refugees seeking asylum or migrants. Human rights are universal and indivisible. Migrants should not be treated, mistreated, nor should parents be separated from their children, nor they should they nor should their children deprive of the right to education, nor they should be deprived access to health care. They should benefit from the rule of law, due process, and independent courts, and be protected from arbitrary and extra-legal treatment. If migrant workers are to benefit from protections under the important International Labor Convention, referred in paragraph two of the Global <coughs> Compact, this should be ratified by all member states and systematically applied. For migrant workers, their principal enabling rights are the right to form and join trade unions and to engage in collective bargaining to improve their conditions of work. However, there are many situations where migrant construction workers are deprived of the right to organize and bargain collectively, either because they work in countries which denies those rights to workers across board, or because migrants are excluded from the rights that protect the nationals of the country or they may be excluded from the effective exercise of those rights because of precarious or temporary work, or because their engagement in circular migration schemes. Unfortunately, human and labor rights of migrant workers are routinely violated in many countries. However, we do have good examples and good practice. We, in this regard, I would like to speak about Qatar, where progress is being made. In 2016, BWI negotiated an agreement with the Supreme Committee 
for the delivery and legacy of Qatar, the body that is responsible for organizing the FIFA 2022 World Cup in Qatar. We are conducting joint inspections to ensure that rigorous, rigorous health and safety standards are maintained for the benefit of workers on the construction site of the Qatar's World Cup stadiums and that the accommodation facilities for workers on the World Cup meet decent and humane living condition. This agreement followed years of engagement uh, with the Qatari authorities in addressing the rights and treatment of construction workers in the country. More recently, we also reached an agreement with the QDVC Vansi, the first BWI agreement with, with the Qatari company. Both agreement place a priority on health and safety. Both provide the right for workers to be elected and trained in workers' committees that serve as grievance mechanism for workers to address their concerns. And both provide mechanism for ensuring fair recruitment. The reason I am mentioning this example is that they demonstrate that the good normative principles of human and labor rights espoused by the Global Compact for Migration can be upheld. Contrary to the reservation expressed by some member states during the re recent negotiations of the Global Compact. They serve to benefit the economy, the companies involved, and the workers. They are serving to move workers closer to the achievement of those enabling, enabling rights mentioned earlier. Clearly, there are capacity development questions to be addressed in all of this work. In this regard, we welcome, the trade union movement welcome, the establishment of the capacity building mechanism as a component of the implementation of the Global Compact. However, the implementation of CBM must be grounded in sustainable development goals and in human rights principle that promotes the well-being of migrants and their families. There is a need for capacity development among governments to align their laws and institutions, including labor inspectorates, with the international standard. They must enforce their law systematically in even in face of pushback from powerful multinational companies or political interest. This requires political will and effective government, governance to make sure that enforcement is not derailed. Another important area for capacity development and in some cases resource allocation is the regulation of recruitment agencies or support for a creation of a non-commercial recruitment agencies. These agencies plays an important role in supplying workers to destination countries. There are outrageous abuses by recruitment agencies taking every day. There is a need for bilateral and regional agreements to regulate the recruitment industry. However, good governance is key. If elected politicians or government officials are getting their cut from exploitative recruitment practices, the best capacity in the world will change nothing. The ILO has developed fair recruitment program with recommendations and a web platform to assist workers through the recruitment process. But much more needs to be done by governments to make fair recruitment a reality. In this regard, the action items in Objective 6 
of the Global Compact on Ethical Recruitment and Decent Work should be fully adhered to, including full use of the ILO general principles and operational guidelines for fair recruitment. Regional and bilateral agreements covering labor migration and recruitment must operate in accordance with the principles of fair migration as enshrined in the ILO Convention on Migration. The principle of equal treatment and non-discrimination in remuneration and condition of work must be applied. If one worker has a different wage from another, doing the same work simply because they are from different countries, rational systems and efficient workable industrial relations will never develop. It is not fair and workers rightfully resent these differences. If we can move towards fair labor standard in countries where my migrant workers are employed and achieve enabling rights to join trade union and bargain collectively, we'll be well on our way in fulfilling key commitments of the Global Compact. In conclusion, let me reiterate that if capacity development initiatives are to bear fruit and help make change possible, they must operate in a framework of rights and political will. We from the trade union movement are ready, willing, and able to work closely with IOM, with ILO, with the governments, and all the stakeholders to give life to the global compact and to give hope to the migrant workers and their families for dignity and decent work. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think that uh, from the four speakers, we got quite a, a variety of ideas. Uh, I would just like to, to emphasize four of them, one of each, which is a very balanced approach. Um, <laughs> I start with the, the idea that uh, countries can have national action plans to implement uh, the Global Compact, which means that in adopting such action plans, they are setting their own priority because, as uh, it has been said, the Global Compact has a 300-degree view, uh, but uh, some parts of the text are more fancy for some countries, some parts are more fancy for others. So it will be interesting to see how those national action plans will allow to establish the bridges between the different member states in sustaining the global compact as a whole. The idea of uh, uh, Juan José that we should not depoliticize, I think that I prefer to say depolarize. The problem in politics is not politics. The problem is in politics is when things become too much polarized, yeah. it's extremely difficult to find the middle ground. And the, the danger we are confronted is that pretentiously easy solutions do not solve complex problems. Mm -hmm. And polarization tends to favor so-called easy solutions, that when they fail, well, they fire back in a more, much more dramatic way. So, Depolarization will be essential for the narrative, but the narrative needs also to incorporate the perceptions that different public opinions have about migration. We need evidence base, of course. We need rebuttal, rebuttal, rebuttal of what is false, what is not, does not correspond to the reality. And we need leadership, and therefore parliaments have a key role to play. Because parliamentarians are the ones who are more close to the citizens. Mm -hmm. And this kind of uh, interaction with the public opinions depend a lot on the representation, which is the basic of our democracy. And last but not least, one needs to realize that migration, migration does not aim to disrupt the labor market. Uh, migration, regular migration is uh, essential 
to guarantee not only the human rights of the migrants, but also safe and dignified working conditions, both for migrants and for the population of the countries of destination.